Hello, and welcome to the machine. I'm so excited to talk to you guys tonight, and I think part of the reason why is that I'm doing this a little bit earlier than when I regularly record. As a result, I'm filled to the brim with energy. That, plus the million coffees that I drank today, lead me quite excited to talk about something that I'm curious about, which is curiosity. I think listening is something that's really hard to do, and it's something that can be very rewarding. And I want to start by talking about a personal experience of mine where I benefited immensely from listening before talking about what I learned from You Aren't Listening, a book I recently read on self-help. So let's start by talking about my personal experience. So I was in the championship round of a debate tournament about this topic of whether or not violent revolution was justified by political oppression on balance. And I was analyzing this topic and I was debating it against a very clever young man who was probably league smarter than me in terms of eloquence, in terms of flow, in terms of communicating effectively. I actually felt like I was floundering throughout the entire round. What I was saying wasn't as clear, it wasn't as deliberate, it didn't have the sort of moral clarity that I wished to have. And frankly, I thought I was losing the round. I wasn't sure that I stood a chance and I tried my best, but I noticed a mistake because I was paying attention. Instead of defending the topic at hand, a violent revolution, he primarily justified his argument on self-defense. And while self-defense is compelling, it's interesting, and can probably be used to justify political revolution, he didn't bother doing the legwork. And so noticing that and pointing that out because of the fact that I wasn't trying to prove him wrong when I was asking him questions in this round, and instead I focused on understanding what he was getting at, allowed me to salvage a victory from somebody who was better than me. That ended up winning me $500 and a national championship. That was pretty cool. And in my time debating, I had plenty of experiences where the person who was competing with me was a much more polished speaker, was a lot clearer, was a lot more eloquent, had a better vocabulary than me. Oftentimes they went to better schools, oftentimes some of the best prep schools in the country, and I felt pretty scrappy. But something that can't be replaced is the art of listening, because when you listen, you become more persuasive because you're better able to understand what your opponent's arguments are and address them on the merits instead of taking the straw man of what they're saying and crushing that. And so with that in mind, I want to talk about what I learned from this book called You Aren't Listening, uh, What We Miss and Why It Matters. So. I took some important notes on this when I was reading it because I thought that this would be something that this YouTube channel would benefit for. So when you are in a conversation, one thing that you should be asking yourself is, what did I just learn about that person? What was the most concerning thing to that person today? And how did that person feel about what we were talking about? Oftentimes, we assume that people are going to be talking in an emotionally flat way. I feel sad. I feel happy. I feel humorous. But people aren't like that. And sitcoms don't adequately represent how people interact with other people. Oftentimes there's subtlety and clues and nuance. And as a result, Unless you're paying close attention, you're not going to be finding out what that person really means. So it is of paramount importance that you think about the sort of questions about what are they telling you and why are they telling you. The next thing that this book uh, mentions is that 
rather than taking advice from management gurus whose big thing is to look concerned mm, yeah and nodding it's to actually be in the correct internal state to give in uh to give attention to show that you're listening and to also allow for awkward pauses awkward pauses many people think are not okay they think awkward pauses are something that will wreck a conversation dead in its tracks and that it's going to make people dislike you that's not exactly true in fact sometimes social faux pas can actually better people and people are more willing to share when they see your full attention which can oftentimes happen when you have more time to think whether it's think about it this way when you have a little bit of time to respond and you decide to take a little bit longer to respond you're able to more clearly articulate what you thought in response to them and you're able to give them your full attention most people don't get very much attention most people are stuck on their screens a lot of the day and so focusing on them is a gift it's something that's very appreciated and in my personal life, I have noticed that when I give people the gift of listening, I am rewarded and people appreciate it. The next thing that uh, this book recommends is to be a detective with information. Oftentimes, people have reasons for telling you certain things. So if, if they're telling you these things, you should be asking yourself, what are they really saying? And what are they trying to communicate below the surface? As somebody who hasn't always been the best at picking up on conversational cues, as you spend more time asking these questions, and as you interact with more types of people, you become better at understanding what people are really trying to say. Because oftentimes people aren't going to be overt about certain things. Oh, are you sure that dress looks good on you? Might be code for that dress is ugly or it makes you look fat because you can't just say that a lot of the time. And it's important to recognize this. The next thing you should note is to be open to someone else's experiences, ideas, and acknowledge their point of view. Nothing is more frustrating than interacting with somebody whose mind is entirely closed, who isn't listening to you. It can, it can feel so incredibly frustrating and draining and the lack of receptiveness can really hurt. And so when you are open with someone else's experiences, ideas and point of view, it's a gift, but it also is a gift to yourself too because it puts you in a vulnerable position. When you hear something that's uncomfortable, your first impulse is no, this can't happen. But oftentimes we learn things when people tell us things and this helps us develop and understand things in a way that we would otherwise not. Another um, note that this book reminds us is that our mind wanders when we listen and a big part of that is because we're thinking about what we want to say next. When you don't assume that you have something ready, when you're not about to jump in with a line, you are able to really absorb in a way that makes sense. There's this improv show, I forgot what it was, it was written down at some point in the book, and they take a lot of these famous comedians and they have them basically uh, like participate in a show. And some of these comedians are some of the most depressed people because they feel like they're just waiting to talk rather than getting to know somebody and their struggles. And so when we, when we don't listen, we isolate ourselves and we make ourselves feel worse. So um, there were a couple book recommendations or author recommendations uh, that this book recommended as well. Ralph Nichols, Naomi Henderson, and there's no good card for this, what to do and say when life is scary, awful and unfair to people you love. Uh, both the authors and the titles seemed to be interesting things to read if you're interested in this subject area. But um, another point that was raised later in this book is that listening is sort of like meditation in that you understand that there are distractions associated with it, but you try to rise above these distractions. And a big part of listening is resisting these mental side trips where there's something that's interesting or something that's caught your eye. But if you focus on that thing, you're not giving the person in front of you 
your attention. And so it's sort of a draining experience as well as like a compelling experience when you listen to someone. Another point that was brought up was this idea that it is challenging to get started, but when you develop a, a very good conversation, it really leaves you feeling energized and fulfilled. And so fulfilling someone else's emotional need for this is something that's very appreciated and something that is kind. Another thing that apparently tends to do a good job of improving your interpersonal relationships is to hear what people are saying out before disagreeing in your head with them. And part of the reason why we should do that is because we only become secure by allowing our convictions to be challenged. So when you're listening to somebody who disagrees with you, it's important to try and listen to learn about why might I be wrong as opposed to why might this other person be wrong? Because it's already pretty easy to come up with excuses as to why somebody who disagrees with you has an incorrect view on life, but it's harder to understand sympathetically why someone has views that are different. And when you listen entirely, you have the possibility of improving your perspective, of learning why you might be wrong, or the sort of other parts of Mill's trident that um, maybe why you're right, or maybe um, a slightly different angle to this truth. Um, and it's important to recognize that when you understand something, it isn't always binary. It's not like A or B. It could be a gradient between them, A and B, or neither A nor B. And as a result, sometimes getting caught in this dichotomous way of thinking may be unhelpful for getting closest to the truth on the specific subject that you're trying to get into. So if you're going to be trying to improve your listening, there are three intensive activities that can be helpful. First, improv comedy. Improv comedy is known for being helpful in large part because the best people at improv are often the best listeners. They can see where a direction is going and they can work with other people to reach a big payoff. So the thing about improv comedy, I used to do improv comedy, is that it oftentimes is a collaborative activity. It's yes and, and sort of taking people's lead and seeing where people are going. And so if you can do this, you become better and you aren't really focused on delivering lines. And as a result, you become more than the superficial chatter. The second thing is mirroring. So mirroring is a concept known as paying attention to people's body language and imitating it. So when my head moves in this direction, um, and your head should also be moving in this direction, you should be uh, modeling a similar sort of hand motions to what I'm doing. Or maybe you adopt a similar stance and you pay attention. When I move in closer, you move in closer. When I move farther away, you move farther away. And paying attention to this body language can often cue us in to how people are thinking because a large component of how people communicate has little to do with the specific words, but also the intonation, the tone, and also the body language associated. This would mean something entirely different, uh, like, like in terms of how I feel towards somebody than this, where I'm up a lot closer to like something like this, where I'm trying to intimidate a little bit. So um, the final part that improves listening is trying to speak with one voice. So let's say we're both talking at the same time. I'm trying to look at you and guess where you're going while you're talking. We're both trying to guess where we're both going. And this, this is interesting in that it relies upon shared intentionality and understanding. Another thing that this um, book has taught me, so, so the three exercises to summarize again are improv comedy, mirroring, and speaking with one voice. Um, but moving forward, words can be full of echo and euphemism. Oftentimes there's callback jokes 
where there are references to previous conversations, which if you pay attention to, can lead to subsequent engagements with somebody being a lot more interesting and euphemism in the sense that people might not always want to say something directly. And so euphemism can sort of be a way of surrounding or circling a topic that might be uncomfortable. Something that's interesting is that if you are higher in self-monitoring, if you're more self-aware of how you present yourself, you become better at listening as a result of this because you can only be as intimate with others as you are with yourself. And then it brought a couple, um, it brought an interesting example, which was LBJ. A lot of people thought LBJ when he communicated uh, was talking all the time, but the first two minutes of most calls, when they actually got into his presidential records, were from just mm hmm, and just listening to what people had to say. And doing this sort of thing allowed him a lot of power because he was able to hear people's intentions and react to them. And um, this also was brought up in the context of a lot of Asian countries and their deferential approach to listening, in that oftentimes diplomats would sit and listen and hear where other people are coming from before acting, and which as a result allows them to negotiate from a better position where other people's information is more known than your own and you can act to, to sort of improve that. So... Another thing that's um, helpful is that people who are motivated well tend to be better at listening. If you think there's a positive incentive attached to listening, you're probably going to listen more. If you can convince yourself that what you're doing is intrinsically rewarding or that the conversation you're going to have is going to be full of learning, life, vitality, humor, then you're more likely to manifest this into reality. Um, so, so with this in mind, I kind of want to shift into another area, which is that there's two types of responses to people when you communicate. There's broadly a support response and a shift response. So a support response is the core of listening, and it provides acknowledgement and evaluative feedback. And so as a result, it sort of looks like delving deeper into what someone is saying in an open-ended way. Whereas a shift response sort of corners somebody and limits how they want to approach a conversation, whether it's changing the subject, whether it is making it a yes or no binary, whether it's couching advice through euphemism. Do you think that maybe you should get divorced is not a question. It's telling someone to do something and recognizing that and avoiding those sorts of things can oftentimes improve the way you communicate and make people feel a lot better. So another interesting thought was that this idea of failing to listen is global and unproductive, and women tend to focus more on relational and personal information versus statistics as compared to men. So um, that's one of the reasons that women are often seen as better leaders and more capable at dealing with negotiation. Like a lot of venture capital people make claims like women are better at sniffing out people's intentions in part because it seems like they're better at listening because they've more accurately, um, because they're more likely to be doing more of this evaluative judgment and more sniffing out people. So I kind of want to get away from the gender stuff because uh, as interesting as that topic is, I um, have no interest into wading into a can of worms, but I want to instead go to some things that you can do to improve your listening. So one recommend or a set of recommendations that this author makes is you should squelch the impulse to suggest you know how someone feels, to identify the cause of the problem, to tell someone what to, what, someone what to do, to minimize their concerns, to bring perspective with forced positivity and platitudes, or to admire someone's strength. Instead, you should ask questions that get to people's values, people's motives. Some stuff that might be good include, before making a phone call, do you ever rehearse what you're going to say? Why? What would constitute a perfect day for you? When did you last sing to yourself, to someone else? If you were able to live to the age of 90 
and regain either the mind or body of a 30-year-old for the last 60 years of your life, which would you want? A lot of these sorts of questions get to people's core thoughts and help people feel understood in a way that other questions don't. So um, this, this set of questions that I'm bringing up were in the 36 questions to fall back in love. The other thing to note is that um, pitch, loudness, tone, and flow are all things you should be paying attention to when it comes to listening. Um, something I dislike about YouTube is that I'm sort of talking at this camera and I'm not really able to do any of this active listening to ensure that I understand someone better. But um, something that I also found interesting in this book is this willingness to hear stories that sometimes people have makes people less guarded and more trusting. And so telling stories and listening to stories creates a sort of positive bond around people, which is one of the reasons why you might like standing around a campfire and talking. Um, the other thing is people tend to get uncomfortable with gaps in conversation, which are seen as awkward, which is called dead air. But if you learn to master the art of not caring as much about dead air while recognizing it, it makes it more likely that you're going to leave conversations with additional insight and greater understanding of other people because maybe they're going to jump in with something insightful or maybe they're going to tell you something that's worth finding out about. So there are four broad conversational maxims that you are broadly expected to deliver when you're talking, which is quantity, quali quality, which is truth, quantity, which is info we don't know, uh, but also not too much information that it leaves us, uh, us overwhelmed, relation, so a sort of relevance and logical flow to what we're talking about previously, and manner, in that what we're t communicating is re uh, reasonably brief, orderly, and unambiguous. So recognizing through listening how people are acting can also improve how you communicate in the future. Um, finally, uh, before I go into the conclusion area of the book, Sometimes the things we don't want to hear are some of the most important things to hear. And so being open to feedback and listening can really improve our lives, can shift our perspectives, it can make us powerful. All right, so, so now let's talk about not listening. So not listening is seen as a very hurtful activity and that people being ignored is something that oftentimes causes deep psychological wounds. It's one of the reasons why ghosting is considered one of the most hurtful ways of breaking up and tends to cause more emotional pain than allowing people to speak out. So when you're communicating, think of a conversation on these two axes. Number one, whether or not this helps or hinders understanding. And number two, whether this strengthens or weakens a relationship. If you consider how you act and what listening does, um, it's usually the case that being open and and listening can sort of do both of these things, which is good. Uh, there's three more points that are um, kind of that I wrote down. Number one, there's a reason when things happen to us that we want to tell someone. Like a big part of our shared understanding with ourselves is communicating with other people. We are social creatures after all. Second, listening makes you feel. As a result, you become more attuned to others and feel more alive when you become a better listener. Your life becomes more vital, not only because you have better friends, because you show them something that they need, but also because listening is something that is an element of emotional intelligence and it's an element of something that matters. Finally, listening is vulnerable. And it's vulnerable because we might have our fundamental beliefs about the world challenged. So... I challenge listeners of this channel uh, to A, forgive me for a completely disorganized ramble through the book why we aren't listening or you aren't listening and to maybe consider what you'd want to do in your personal lives when it comes to listening better. I think doing so would make you more happy. Thanks for listening and this was The Machine.